Hello, and welcome in the name of Jesus for this time of worship. We're so glad that you're here, and for those of you who might be newer, we would love to connect with you. And a great way you can do that is by heading to our website at walkiechurch.life. This is a great place for all of us to take those next steps. Also, please follow us and engage socially on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Today, in our worship series from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we pick up the story as God fulfills the promise to Abraham and Sarah, blessing them with a child. Unfortunately, there's a problem right away. Also, please consider sharing this video. It is a great way to share Jesus with others. Welcome. Oh, my 
We're reading through Genesis this summer, focusing on the wonderful stories of our beginning. And last week we heard that God changed uh, their names to Abraham and Sarah and promised Sarah would get pregnant and bear a promised son. And now it finally happens. But there's a problem. So hear these words. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit it, shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so we want to give just a quick recap in the story that we're in. When Abram was 75 years old and his wife Sarai, right, was 65 years old and childless, that's when God called Abram to leave their home country and journey to a land that God would show him. So God had promised to make Abram into a great nation, to bless him and to bless all the people on earth through him and his and his family. But they'd been in Canaan for 10 years. They'd been waiting for 10 years, and and they still didn't have a child, so Sarai took uh, matters into her own hands and brought her Egyptian servant, Hagar, to Abram as a surrogate uh, mother. Hagar became pregnant, but then she began to to think less of Sarai, who was, of course, hurt and and angry. But when Abram was 86 years old, Hagar gave birth to a son for Abram and named him Ishmael. But this wasn't God's plan. So 13 years later, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and revealed a new name of God, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And he also gave Abram and Sarai new names, Abraham and Sarah. And God announced that Sarah would give birth to a son. Abraham fell on his face in laughter over the thought of a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman having a a baby. But, But the Lord said they should name the baby Isaac. That means he laughs. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and Sarah as three angel messengers who announced Sarah would have a baby the next spring. When Sarah heard, she spontaneously laughed. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And then we pick up the story. Then the angel messengers left their home and went to look down on Sodom. Abraham was walking with them and and the Lord told Abraham about the injustice of Sodom and Gomorrah and the plan to destroy these cities. The angel messengers turned toward Sodom, and and Abraham actually pleaded for Sodom. Sodom. Abraham said, "Oh, oh Lord, will you really destroy the innocent, righteous, along with the guilty? I mean, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Would you save the city for the sake of 50 righteous people? And the Lord said, okay. If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will save it because of them. Abraham said, since I've already spoken with you, Lord, even though I'm just, even though I'm just dust and ashes, what what if, what if there are just five fewer 
righteous people than 50. Will you destroy the whole city over just five? And the Lord said, if I find 45 righteous people there, I won't destroy it. Abraham spoke again. What if 40 are there? The Lord said, for the sake of 40, I will do nothing. Abraham said, don't be, don't be angry with me, Lord, but let me speak. What, what, if, what if 30 are there? The Lord said, I will not do it if there are 30 there. Abraham said, since I've already decided to speak with my Lord, well, what if 20? What if 20 are there? The Lord said, I will not do it for the sake of 20. Abraham said, don't be angry with me, my Lord, but, but let me speak just once more. What if there are 10? And the Lord said, don't be angry. I'm sorry, the Lord said, I will not destroy the city because of those 10. And then the Lord departed. Now, this is sort of a clever use of ancient Near East bargaining practices, and it's kind of fun to hear uh, how Abraham does that. But it shows that the Lord is a God of justice and isn't in the business of destroying the righteous with the wicked. Unfortunately, there weren't even 10 righteous people there. The angel messengers had left Abraham and uh, gone into Sodom. Abraham's nephew Lot lived there and saw these angel messengers and greeted them. And he urged them as guests to accept his hospitality. He would not let them spend the night in the town square. Lot knew that would be a dangerous thing for guests, so he brought them to his home. He prepared a big meal for them uh, and, and invited them to spend the night with him before then leaving uh, the next morning when they were refreshed. But before they went to bed, the city of men, Sodom, literally all of them from the youngest to the oldest came and surrounded Lot's home and demanded that he bring them out, bring out the guests so that they could know them. That's what the biblical text says. Bring them out because they wanted to know them. Now this was a despicable act. And to be clear, they weren't just asking to, you know, get to know the out-of-town guests. They intended to violently force themselves upon the guests and take what they wanted. Their wickedness wasn't only about assault and gang rape. Their wickedness, their would-be wickedness, would also destroy Lot's hospitality. And in the ancient Near East, the very strong rule of hospitality was literally a matter of of life and death. I mean, hospitality provided guests shelter and it protected them and it fed them. It literally kept them alive in, in times when they could, have, they could have died. Lot tried to prevent the assault and protect the hospitality by what is sort of a unbelievable thing for us, by, by offering his own two daughters to this gang of men. And this was a horror, but, but it shows in this patriarchal culture, this despicable act was somehow less despicable than what would be done to the men. But all of it was evil. And we now see what the Lord meant when he told Abraham about the injustice of Sodom and Gomorrah and why God planned to destroy these cities. There weren't even 10 righteous people in Sodom. One ancient rabbi commented, commented that it, it wasn't all the citizens who went to Lot's home, but that those who didn't go there never tried to stop those who did 
or even speak out again against them. The rabbi said, to condone injustice is just as bad as participating in it. The men of Sodom rejected Lot's plea, and now they turned on Lot too. They wanted to hurt Lot even more than the guests. And they tried to, to bust in. They tried to break down the door. But the angel messengers reached out and they grabbed Lot and yanked him inside and then slammed the door. And then they blinded the men outside so they couldn't figure out how to get inside. The angel messengers told Lot he needed to take his family and flee because the Lord had found the cries of injustice so serious that the angel messengers were there to destroy the city. Lot told his sons-in-law to flee because the Lord intended to destroy the city, but they thought it was a joke and they laughed. But when dawn broke, the angel messengers urged Lot to take his wife and his two daughters and flee so they wouldn't be swept away in the destruction. Lot even hesitated just momentarily, and the angel messengers grabbed him and his wife and the two daughters and physically rushed them outside of the city. And then they said, now run, just run, save your lives. Don't even, don't even look back. And then the Lord rained down burning, burning asphalt onto, onto Sodom and Gomorrah and, and the cities, the, the entire valley, all the people who lived there and even all the vegetation, all of it was destroyed. And at one point, Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Now, some scholars think that the devastation may have been caused by an earthquake associated with fires that ignited the extensive sulfur and bitumen deposits and, and petrochemical springs in the area. And Lot's hesitant wife, she may have well, she may well have been engulfed in the resultant explosion that would have, like, overtaken her. Still, the environmental disaster changing the area from a garden to a wasteland was blamed on human wickedness. These stories are interesting and terrible, but they, they keep before us the idea of God's righteousness, the right relationship with God and, and people. So how does God want humans to behave? And especially for the chosen people, you know, how do we show the world, by the way we live together, how, how God wants us to live? You know, what is it? that God wanted originally in the creation. That's what God wants for us to show others. We're to be a blessing to the rest of the world and to show, you know, that the way of the world, you know, the way the, that the world lives is not the only way to live and certainly not the true way to live. But in that context, then, the child of the promise is finally born. The child is finally born to Abraham and to Sarah in their old age, the old age, 100 years old, 90 years old. But the Lord was attentive to Sarah. She got pregnant and gave birth to a son. Now you remember, Abraham laughed at the idea this could happen. Sarah, she laughed about this too. But now they named this son Isaac, which means laughter. Abraham circumcised Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded, and then Sarah exclaimed, God has given me laughter, and everyone who hears about it will laugh with me. Isaac grew, and the day he stopped nursing, Abraham threw a big party, a big banquet, 
to celebrate how this child was growing. And during dinner, Sarah saw Hagar's son, Ishmael, who was with the son, Isaac. And she saw, she saw Ishmael, the son of the Egyptian servant, Hagar, laughing. That's what she saw. She saw Ishmael, even with Isaac. She saw, she saw Ishmael laughing. This son of the Egyptian servant, Hagar. You know, Sarah had taken her to Abraham as a surrogate mother. 14 years ago, Ishmael was born. But now, but now something about seeing Ishmael laughing at the banquet. They're playing with, with Isaac. Something about seeing Ishmael laughing while he was with the one called He Laughs. Something about that just really stuck in her craw. Seeing Ishmael enjoying himself seemed to mock her own joy and perhaps reminding her about her own doubting laughter and, well, and the fact that there was an older child of her husband's, a firstborn son that could cause problems for her son Isaac. And in a fury, Sarah went to Abraham and demanded that he cost, demanded that he cast Hagar and Ishmael away. She didn't, she didn't want Ishmael to share any of Isaac's inheritance. And the text says that Abraham was terribly upset because the boy was his son. But which son is he talking about? It's, in a narrative way, sort of deliciously ambiguous. Abraham was upset because the boy was his son. But which son? Why is he upset about which son? Sure, he was upset about evicting his own son, Ishmael. But he was also upset about his son Isaac, too. I mean, what would happen to Isaac, who grew up suffering the loss of his half-brother? Abraham didn't know what to do. And then El Shaddai, God Almighty, told him that it was okay. He didn't have to be upset. He could do what Sarah demanded because the chosen people would come from Isaac. I mean, that was God's plan. This is what God planned. And Isaac is the child of the promise. But God acknowledged that Ishmael was Abraham's son too and will become a great nation too. That God would take care of Ishmael as well. Early the next morning, Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away. It's kind of this wrenching moment. But this satisfied Sarah's command, sending her away. But he also provided something for the outcasts. It wasn't much. It was just some bread and a flask of water. It was something, something for a chance of survival being cast out into the sort of furnace blast of the wilderness. And they left and wandered through the desert. And finally the water in the flask ran out. And then in this sort of desperation and pain, Hagar put her son Ishmael under a desert shrub to give him the only comfort there was from the merciless sun. And then she walked away from Ishmael and sat down at a distance and cried out in grief and wept. She'd gone off some distance because she could not bear to see her boy die from exposure. Hagar. Hagar, who was an Egyptian servant given to Sarah. She served as a surrogate 
mother and bore a child for Abraham. And then after doing that, at Sarah's request, she was treated so badly. She hadn't done well either, but, but she was treated so badly by Sarah. So badly that she and her son were finally cast out. They were evicted. They were thrown out. And they found themselves in, in a blast furnace of, of a desert wilderness. Left to die. And she couldn't take it. She sat down at a distance from her son and cried out in grief and wept. But God heard. God heard. It says God heard the cries of the boy, which is interesting because the text says that Hagar's the one who went off to a distance and, and, and wept and cried in grief. But it says that God heard the cries of the boy. But certainly God heard the, the weeping of Hagar as well. And God sent an angel messenger to comfort her, told her, not to be afraid, to pick up the boy, take us by the hand, because the Lord will make him a great nation as well. And then God opened her eyes and revealed to Hagar a nearby well. And Hagar and Ishmael were filled with joy and laughter as they were filled with water and life. God took care of Ishmael. And Ishmael grew up, lived in the wilderness, became especially adept with the bow, and eventually Hagar got a wife for him from her home country, Egypt. And in all of this, God remained with the boy Ishmael. So do we, what do we do with this story of our beginning? Well, you might know the opening line of the, the novel, Moby Dick. The opening line is, call me Ishmael. It's one of the most recognizable lines in all of classic Western literature. And perhaps by uh, a bit like that novel, these stories, again, are interesting and sometimes terrible. But they keep, they keep, before us, this idea of God's righteousness, the right relationship with God and other people. How does God want humans to behave? And especially, especially for the chosen people, how do we show the world by the way we live together how God actually wants us all to live? What God intended originally in creation. As God's people were to be a blessing to the rest of the world and show that the way of the world, you know, the way that, that so much of the world lives, that the way of the world is not the only way to live and certainly not the true way to live. And so these stories, they tell us about righteousness and blessing and hospitality. That's what we're supposed to be all about. But instead, right after the miraculous birth of Isaac, the response is anger, Jealousy, rejection, banishment, and near death. There's no righteousness. There's no blessing. There's, there's no hospitality for Hagar and Ishmael. And yet the Lord takes care of them because God hears. God hears the cries of pain, the weeping, and God cares for people, these people, and God cares for all people, not just the chosen people. God obviously cares for all people. God is at work not only in the chosen people of God, but also in the midst of other peoples in the world as well. And this is an example for us. You know, we're supposed to be an example for others, but this from God is an example for us. Okay, sure, there are problems uh, with us, right? Because human beings are the carriers of God's promise and there can and will be obstacles because just like Abraham and Sarah, as humans, we're fallible. We mess up. We have blemishes and foibles. We hurt others. 
but God hears the cries of pain and shows us how to be a blessing to the world. That's an example for us to accept all people, to include them, and to care for them, to protect them, and to bring, bring them life, especially those in pain and brokenness. Be agents of healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. Because God called Abraham and Sarah's family and, and those of us who are grafted onto that family, those chosen people, God has called us to be an example to the rest of the world, to show the world by the way we live together what it means to be the world that God intended in creation. To show the rest of the world that the way of the world is not the only way and certainly not the true way to live. There are, there's another way that God wants. For now, Ishmael is gone and out of the way. Only Isaac remains to carry forward God's promise. But what if happens something, but what if something happens to Isaac? Let us pray. God of our ancestors, you are the God of our future. You showed mercy to Hagar and Ishmael in the desert just as you answered Sarah's laughter with Isaac's birth. God, you hear the cries of all the people in the world. Help us when we turn against one another, when we fail to care for the weak and poor among us. Open our ears and minds and hearts when we pay no heed to the cries of the powerless and only seek our own advantage. We pray that you heal the deathly divisions between all people on the earth today. Help us as your people from Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac to live as an example for the world, showing the world what it means to be the world you intended originally in creation. Help us to show the rest of the world that their, their way of the world is not the only way, and certainly not the true way to live. We pray for world leaders and diplomats who seek to make peace among nations. May their su success be measured in generations who live free from fear of war. We pray for medical professionals committed to healing, especially those in areas of poverty or violence. May they be guided and guarded by the spirit who lifts up the brokenhearted, even raises the dead. We pray for teachers, school staff, and administrators and students, especially those in high-risk communities. May they find strength in you to reach beyond themselves and to embrace the future with the hope that you are holding for them. We pray for your promised kingdom to come, when all wars will cease and there will be no disease, when courageous f faith, hope, and love cast out hatred and poverty. We pray now for ourselves, our families, and those we love, especially for all those who we lift up to you, Lord, silently in our hearts and minds. Almighty God, your Son emptied himself upon a Roman cross and revealed your eternal, self-giving love for all people. We pray that the Church of Jesus Christ will be so filled with the Holy Spirit, so committed to the head of the Church, that we will have Christ's mind among us. Give us compassion for suffering, a suffering world in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Hello, thank you for connecting with us. Here are some next steps for our faith journey. Vacation Bible School this year is Sunday, August 13th, right after worship. Kids going into pre-K through fifth grade are invited to attend. Discovery on Adventure Island has fun games and crafts, great music, large group sessions, and more. Talk to Director of Discipleship Drew Klein to volunteer. We need lots of help. And go to our website, walkiechurch.life, and find the Vacation Bible School tab to register a child. 
Are you interested in taking the next step to become a member of the church? Pastor John will be offering a new member orientation this summer. Contact the church office or Pastor John directly if you'd like more information. Our congregation is transitioning to a single board model instead of the traditional structure of administrative council, staff parish relations team, finance, and trustees. The new board will be 12 people and the pastor, and the nominations committee wants your help in discerning uh, who the congregational spiritual leaders are by asking the question, if you were in a spiritual crisis and your pastor, staff, and retired pastors were all unavailable, who in this church would you call? You can submit a name using the, either the paper form at the Welcome Center or at the church board nomination tab on our website at walkiechurch.life slash nominations. If you have any questions, the nomination committee members are listed on the paper and on the website. Thank you for your help. Finally, you're welcome to give an offering today in person in the offering box located outside of our multi-ministry center or at our website walkiechurch.life or directly through our Realm app. Thank you for your support of the mission and ministry of this church. I'm Michaela Craigmel. I'm the administrative assistant here. You can contact me in the office at any time. And please don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for joining with us. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.